这是南京，呃，就是外滩这边一个浦航银行的一个改造。那么最下面这个，中间下面的这个呢，是北京的一个前门考场的一个酒店改造，是把这个四合院项目改造成我们一个酒店。那么这个是有一点点历史保护的性质，但是啊、呃，它跟我们传统的就是非常久远的那种古城又不一样。那所以我觉得就是说，呃，今天我想分三个方面来做一个分享。第一个就是我们。城市更新项目的一个分类，还有我们项目的一些消防的难点啊，以及创新解决方案的一些案例分享。那我从消防的方面，呃，专业上我大概把我们这个呃城市更新的项目分为这么几类。第一类就是这种历史风貌类的，比如说刚才我们卓院长着重这块讲的比较深入，呃，像刚才包括嘉定新城的这些一些历史风貌建筑的保护。那么还有一些消防的问题，比如说岭南天地的一些保护，上海外滩，呃，再一个就是综合整治类的。那这一类的，比如说像很多城市里的这种城中村啊，这个可能有一些村是很过的，有一些村是谈不上古老，但是也是属于这种城市更更新当中面临的一个问题。比如说，呃，这个，呃，瑞安在上海这个老西门那边，呃，搞的一些这个。基于综合整治类的这种一些开发，那么还有一个就是功能改变的，比如说我们把一些后工业时代的一些建筑活化啊，作为一些商业功能或者是文化功能。Other types, for example, we try to change the functions of old buildings, for example, the old shipyard in Shanghai, as well as the Luohu. There is a place in Luohu that fits. That or falls into that category, and there is another type, which is to turn property or housing into commercial buildings. So all these are different types or different requirements in urban renewal. And then I want to talk about some of our previous cases, the Guiyuan Temple Block renovation project. Falls into the category of the preservation of historic buildings. Guiyuan Temple in Wuhan is quite famous, both on the ground and uh, um, and uh, above ground and underground were part of the renovation project. And now I'm showing you the Cao Chang. This is in Beijing. We did a project in that area. We changed or we refurbished one part of that area and turned that into hotel, Mandarin Oriental. So it's about comprehensive treatment. Another type of comprehensive treatment is the treatment of urban villages, as you will find in Shenzhen as well as in Shanghai. But in Shanghai, such projects are more costly. So most of the projects are in Shenzhen. In doing the project in Shenzhen, we compiled a technical specifications menu on fire protection when it comes to this type of project. And finally, the change of function. We see most of the cases it falls into this category, such as renovation of airports or renovation of commercial buildings. As you can see, that we did a project in Hongqiao Airport. Together with a partner, we renovated the inner side of the airport. So usually the outside of the building was maintained, but inside we did some change. There is another category Adjustment of the decoration. Cases that fall into this category are also abundant. So I've given you a rough classification of different types of projects. And from a fire protection's perspective, I have summarized seven thorny issues. And I think whenever you start working on such projects, you have to tackle all seven thorny issues. First is about the property. 
or the nature of the property. Because sometimes if you file an application for a project, sometimes you'll find that the building does not have um, a residence, meaning that, as you can see on the slide, we turned a housing into a hotel because it was a housing, it wasn't public infrastructure, so it couldn't get approval. This is the same thing, or the same is true for the shipyard project that you see in the middle that requires innovative thinking. As project progress, well, I'm not sure if my understanding is correct, but usually in cities like Shanghai, their latest policy is when doing review of the fire protection design, viewers will not look at the function or the plan function. They only do review according to the function of the charts. But I'm not sure if my understanding is correct. Correct me if I'm wrong. The second thorny issue is historical problems. For example, some projects have yet completed, they haven't been completed. And some projects are already there. So you, you will find your hands tied when you try to do renovation. For example, the existing building is very close to the adjacent building. So there's no way for you even to erect the wall. And I would like to share with you a case we did in Shenzhen. We renovated the urban village and the houses were quite close. As fire protection people, we have to demolish part of the wall in order to make sure that the distance is there, which means that you also need to do some innovations. And the third thorny issue is restrictions of conditions. And I've summarized it into two categories. One is the conditions of the site. And the second is inner conditions. For example, restrictions as a result or restrictions imposed by the structure or the tube well or the core tubes. Because the structures, there is no way for you to simply demolish the inner structure or the core tube because they're essential. Although fire protection is important. So that makes fire protection harder if you wanna consider it in an existing building compared with deploying or installing such facilities in an old building. Well, actually, a lot of the regulations were established in the 1980s. And the regulations are now being renewed constantly. So we have to think very clearly. The building itself and the regulation has been upgraded constantly, becoming more and more stringently. So the regulations are now becoming more strict, stricter. But the building is still there. 
just because the regulations are now becoming stricter, we also need to upgrade our understanding of the safety level of the building, existing building. So the current regulations and policies are based on the background that urbanization is going on rapidly and extensively. So it's not tailored to the refined city upgrade. And the existing buildings, they are not in alignment with the regulations, the current regulations. And the next point is about operation in the process of renovation. Some of the buildings needs to be operated at the same time be renovated. So we have to guarantee that the construction process or the renovation process will not affect the non-renovated areas. In the process of renovation, how are we going to arrange the time order in order to minimize the impact on the operation of the building itself? Or you can say, you know, we're going to shut off the building completely, but that's going to lead to economic, economic loss. So we need to think very clearly about the time order and also the arrangements of, of the process. How to separate the renovation from the normal operational parts of the building. So all these challenges, I would like to share with you some of my solutions. The integrated fire control solution. Previously, I also joined some other seminars, especially a seminar in Hong Kong, the protection of the Hong Kong High Court building. They also adopted holistic solution because it is a holy wood architecture. So when we are trying to come up with a fire control plan, we need to take the whole building into consideration, not just about the wood. So first of all, we need to lead by the fire control approval model. A lot of historic districts, the shops over there, involves a lot of risks. If there's no accident, then everything is good. But if there is a accident, then going to lead to disastrous outcomes. So we need to innovate our regulations and approval uh, approval process. So top level design, highly important. Three types, three categories to adopt different approval models. For example, some we can approve as new projects, others we need to approve as interior decoration projects. And yet some others, we need innovative methods to customize fire control principles dedicated to this specific project. And then we can also consider coming up with a fire control guideline for a specific area or industry. so that we have a guideline to refer to. And then we also need to respect the case differences for historic buildings and for projects of city renew. There can be numerous variants 
involving different stakeholders, interest parties, interested parties. So we really need to consider case by case. And then we also need to pay great attention to establishing the expert joint review of some special pro projects. So this is a whole life cycle designing process. First of all, we need to conduct due diligence as the first step. We need to not just look at the drawings, especially for the renewal projects. We need to go over there on site to learn And then we need to identify the specific category. Is it for protection? Is it for refurbishment or for reconstruction? And then we need to come up with relevant fire control principles and standards. For some special projects, we need to also come up with special specific fire control plan. And then we need to identify the weak links in terms of fire control to offer differentiated plans. And then the fifth step, also very important, is the coordination, the multidisciplinary coordination in order to come up with an integrated fire control strategy. So it's not dominated by one discipline only. We need to fully respect the designers, the operators, the party A's, all stakeholders to take into consideration different perspectives. We need to respect them, all of them. So it's multidisciplinary and integrated, specific to the project. After that, a holistic assessment. And then I add one more point. Afterward management operation also highly important. Post operation, post management, we need to take into consideration post management in the first step in the designing phase. So, for identification of risks for a project, I think very important. In the beginning stage, we need to look at the potential risks in the whole process and its implications on design. How are we going to make up for these risks? One step after another, at the beginning stage to fully assess the potential risks and to identify them before designing the drawings, coming up with the strategies. This is a due diligence survey of a Beijing Guibing Lou restaurant. And another case is Starbucks Roastery. Risk identification. After that, we need to decide whether this is a renovation project or a completely new project. New projects, renovative projects, expansion project, different categories. So when we're talking about city upgrade, we need to First of all, identify the potential risks and then to decide on the category of projects. If it is a special project that does not fall into any category, then we need to come up with a specific plan. So the beginning stage of the project is highly important to identify and to decide on the specific category of the project. So the Starbucks Rose Tree, this project, 
the round structure is for roasting coffee bean. for roasting purpose to be transported through the pipes to be further dried. If it is an industrial building, then this is the whole process. But this building is located in the downtown area of Shanghai, in the shopping mall, actually. So is it industrial or commercial building? Is it a restaurant or is it a factory? Because the whole process is just like that in the factory, but it is inside a shopping mall. It is basically a restaurant, coffee shop. So how are we going to identify this building? This is a very important project. One of the biggest Starbucks roastery. According to the US standard, it's totally feasible. This is a, this is a factory, this is a shopping mall, but in China, these two are conflictory. So at the beginning, we did a very thorough study. So we studied its technique, the pressure, the gas pressure, and also the separation methods and the process of, of production. The gas pressure that it uses is actually quite low. So eventually we identified it as a restaurant building. So I'm raising this example to share with you the idea that at the beginning stage, it is highly important to identify the nature of the building, followed by design and assessment. So at the beginning, I emphasize that we need to adopt this holistic design and thinking. Another example is, is the Shanghai Old Shipyard in Pudong. Dongchang Road, very classic industrial building to be transformed into a chic commercial complex. We also invited a very famous Japanese designer. So this complex is multifunctional shopping, leisure, performance, traveling, tourism, all together. So we maintained the appearance of the architecture and inside there are different components serving different purposes. Previously was a shipyard. The structure of the shipyard was maintained. One challenge, inside such a big space to design so many commercial components, how are we going to do the design? As a shopping mall, it's not a real shopping mall. So we made some innovations, for example, first of all, structure shall be given priority. We have to make sure that the structure is complete and it has to be safe meaning that whatever happens, the outer structure shall always remain intact. And that is most important thing. And with that in place, most of the project, or we can, we are assured that the safety of the project is guaranteed. And then if you can take a look at the zoning on the bottom left of the slide, by zoning, we actually managed to design some public space. It feels like we were in an airport. So that way we're able to address the issue of the segregation of zones in order to achieve fire protection. 
and also we design some evacuation places. So that's our systematic approach to this project. And that's the, these are the principles that we always abide by, not only for this project, but also for some of the projects that we did after this. So I've just shared with you some of the ideas in fire protection. Of course, it requires on-site investigation because you have to make sure that your design can be achieved on site. And also you have to take into consideration the structure, the infrastructure, as well as other facilities. But also there are some differences when it comes to different projects and different buildings, because sometimes you will always find places or points that you do not have a menu to follow. And in order to address these issues, you have to innovate once again. For example, there is a project in Beijing the building was built as early as 1973. Premier Chou Lai proposed that we needed this hotel in Beijing. So that's the origin or that's how the building or how the hotel came into being. But it was built back in 1973. So there is no way for you to find the original manual well, that brings up a great challenge when we do projects. Instead of using an existing ruler to measure the building, actually, you have to consider its current status because there is no manual to follow. There is no standardized manual. It requires innovation. For example, in this project, there is the issue that it doesn't have enough number of elevators or fire protection elevators. So basically what we did is we didn't confine ourselves to the rules or provisions. Instead, we look at the status of the building and we always follow the principle of reducing the risk while improving the level of safety of the project, which means that we are always results oriented. And also, I want to give you another example to illustrate another point about multi-party cooperation mechanism. So this building was used to be a marketplace, a closed marketplace, but then it was bought, it was bought by ByteDowns and ByteDowns turned it into its office buildings. So here I want to once again illustrate the need for multi-party cooperation. Owners have their own considerations and we have our design ideas. There are also third party reviewers and there are other stakeholders. So I have to take into consideration different ideas of different stakeholders in order to provide a plan that we can reach a consensus on. So in the interest of time, I didn't go into much details I've only given you an overview of what we have been doing. If you're interested in our work, feel free to contact me after the salon or the seminar. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Sun, for your detailed introduction. Actually, he made a very good point. A lot of things that we have to deal with do not have a existing uh, manual to follow. So it requires innovation by all of us. Next, we're going to go into the panel discussion part. For the panelists, we have Mr. Zhuo and Alan Sun, but we also have Wen Guo from Ong Kofko, as well as Ren Jiajun from Shanghai branch of China Construction. 
Eighth Engineering Division Corp. So as you can see from the background of the panelists, we have guest speakers from Design Institute, from risk background, as well as from engineering background. And the moderator for the panel discussion is Mr. Wang Xingnan, Secretary General of Shanghai Smart Park Development Promotion Association. The floor is yours, Mr. Wang. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and good morning. So I'll be moderating the panel discussion. According to our plan, panelists will be invited to the uh, front of the room if you were to express your opinions. My name is Wang Xinnan. I'm the Secretary General of Shanghai Smart Park Development Promotion Association. And today's topic concerns Jiading. I used to work in Jiading, so the ancient street in Jiading, as well as the Jiading Museum, are something that I know very well about. The Jiading Museum was actually designed by Dr. Zhuang Shen, who is from a member of ours, us. So after listening to today's presentations, actually I found the topics quite interesting because it concerns two points. Mr. Zhu from Art Plus talk about how to preserve ancient buildings and our second speaker talk about fire protection. Actually, in a lot of the cases concerning historic buildings, fire protection is always a top concern. For example, there is a recent case in Chongqing, an ancient building was burned. I felt sorry for that. So that the, the topic is something dear to my heart. We have four guest speakers, as I've already introduced. So I will invite Wang Wu and Mr. Ren Jiajun to deliver your uh, ideas first. The first panelist is Mr. Ren Jiajun from the Shanghai branch of China Construction Aid Engineering Company. To the friends, good afternoon and good morning. So I will be giving you a brief sharing and I'm, I'm grateful to the organizer for giving me this chance. I'll talk about three things. First is about the current standards applicable to renovation and urban renewal. And second, I will talk about the extensive application of IoT and smart fire protection facilities. And finally, I will talk about the need to lay equal emphasis on the correct use of fire protection facilities and their maintenance. A few words about me. I used to be an expert working on the Yampu district construction project management affairs center. I work as a fire protection facilities review and inspection expert. I was involved in more than 40 projects and now I'm still an external ex expert at that center. So first of all, about the standards and technical specifications. Actually, these standards and specifications keep changing. So you have to make sure that you are always up to date. In considering this issue, not only do we consider fire protection, also we take into consideration overall design in order to provide owners with better product. Of course, in urban renewal, 
we still have to follow existing rules and standards. Of course, there are national level requirements. For example, the number, the, there is a document issued on May the 12th, 2020, talking about the implementation methods on managing decoration and construction projects in Shanghai. And then I want to talk about some specific cases, as well as some of the common issues that a lot of projects have, tend to have. First of all, if there are changes in various professional systems, you need to add additional facilities and equipment. For example, if you do a project renovation, you need to add a new dedicated smoke exhaust machine room. As previous speakers already mentioned, you have to consider whether the, the on-site conditions are fit for accommodating such a new machine room. Of course, this is not easy. For example, if you put the room on rooftop, you have to consider if there is enough space for you to do it. And for the pipelines, are there spaces for you to lay the pipelines? And will the occupants be accept, uh, be willing to accept the fact that some of the pipelines might occupy their space? And the second thing is, about centralized power supply for centralized control. I think that might apply to the preservation of ancient blocks. And sometimes water tank have to be added at the rooftop. So all these falls into the category of the need to add additional facilities and equipment. And the second issue is when it comes to the change of function, you have to add evacuation and refugee facilities. For example, if you change some commercial buildings into kindergartens, then you need to add evacuation stairs and refugee room. And if a building were to be changed into a old people's home, then you have to add toilets. You have to add washroom on each floor, which means that you have to add such facilities specifically for this specific building. And thirdly, when it comes to adding new systems, you have to consider how to implement them. For example, sometimes they are systems that are needed for the new building, but they didn't exist. So if you want to add these systems, you have to think about how to actually do it. And then I want to talk about the application of IoT and smart fire protection facilities. The urban renewal, urban construction, as well as the expansion of projects, you can consider the use of IoT devices in order to achieve smart fire protection. Some of the devices are already available in the market, including fire extinguishing ball and wireless sound and light alarm equipment. But of course, you have to know them full well in order to install them. For example, the fire extinguishing ball is already used in a lot of buildings. The wireless sound and light alarm equipment is also used in a lot of buildings. IoT is already used in a lot of projects as well. For example, in some construction facilities, there's another system, a wireless smart smoke alarm system. It's already used in many projects as well. All these are used for buildings, smart buildings. And then I want to talk about, is it possible that we adopt these flexible approaches to on the one hand meet requirements of fire protection, 
and on the other hand, better accommodate to emerging and new requirements of users. For the designing company, they are in charge of the quality of designing. And for the construction company, they're responsible for the quality of the building itself so that it can be used well. So the quality of the design of the building itself, of operation, all good. Safety of operation is directly facing the customers and the management and operation capabilities directly linked to fire safety and risk level. So good management and operation can significantly reduce the potential of risks. So that the fire control facilities can actually be used instead of just serving sitting there as an ornament. So we really would rather hope that these fire control facilities will never be used, but we still need them to be usable when they are needed. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Guo. We are sharing. Now I'd like to turn the floor to Mr. Guo Wei to share with us his thoughts on safety risks. For us, for our company, our job is different. We're a counselor, we're a counselor in the insurance industry, so we want to help our customers. For example, the old town in Guizhou and Sichuan, Notre Dame in Paris, Fire risks actually are everywhere. So in the process of city renewal, fire control upgrades are faced with a lot of challenges and obstacles, including six aspects. These are all old buildings, some involving a lot of wood, And they were built many, many years ago, so not compliant with the risk control regulations. Fire separation not sufficient. 
very close to each other. His historic districts in the remote areas, they also have very unique architecture structure, the roof, very different from what we usually see nowadays. Currently, if fire happened in the modern building, then the firefighters can get upstairs through the fire lane, etc. But these buildings, they were built many years ago without such facilities in place. A lot of commercial development too. There are residents, restaurants, hotels, restaurants, coffee shops, tea houses, and even some theaters. So it's really complex ecosystem. There's no one size fits all method. Oak Town, the fire lane, eva evacuation, and also facilities quite different from what we usually see. So totally uncompliant with the regulations. So in summary, in the process of city upgrade, there are so many challenges leading to high difficulty for putting out a fire because the architectures, the buildings are quite close to each other without sufficient fire control facilities, especially those wood structures. So now it is fire control gates. We need to look at its fire resistance duration time, but also the structure of the of the gate of the door itself, which to are totally inaccessible in the ancient buildings. So in reality, how are we going to manage the fire control in these areas? So complex, so many factors involved. Lack of fire control, fire control separation distance. So as a risk counselor, what are our thoughts? What are our thoughts? How are we going to carry our risk control? Hopefully these points will resonate with you. Personally speaking, I think we need to go by three steps. There definitely is going to be a committee involved in the protection of ancient buildings. So on the macro level, we need to have a big direction. We believe district or natural conditions should be taken into consideration to be reserved. Now we're talking about separation, separated zone for fire control. In the insurance industry, we would look for the biggest risky areas not to be confined by national laws or regulations. So the local government on the macro level, they need to take into consideration the district separation and also the natural landscape of this region. And then to set up a grand guideline for putting out fires, contingency plans. 
So for a historic district like this, you cannot say, you know, which area is, is a separated fire control area. It's very difficult. So we will categorize block by block or to separate categorize by water lines. And then we go to the micro level in a specific block. These buildings, how are we going to decide on the guideline for protection of these buildings and fire control? Two steps. The first, these are all historic districts, but which buildings are of significant cultural, cultural heritage? Which buildings are actually antique buildings with high historic value? We need to identify those significant buildings. Are we going to maintain the building as it is, or are we going to take some measures to improve the building? For other types of buildings, for example, in Forbidden City, there used to be Starbucks. So there are some buildings in the same district, which is not that ancient, without too much historic value. If you want to open a restaurant inside these buildings, for example, a subway or a Chinese restaurant, or a hotel. We need to set up different criteria for different ecosystem, for different purposes. And the fire control equipment, the streets are really narrow, so it's very difficult to upgrade the fire control facilities. For example, in Nanjing Fuzi Temple, you can put in some underground underground facilities and sometimes just those sporadic sporadic fire extinguishers. We need to take into consideration the specific condition of that district of that block and also do a lot of um, a lot of promotion. To raise the awareness of people and then Aside from the daily rehearsal and the spot check, we need to use some economic measures to mobilize people. The higher the risk, the higher the premium in terms of insurance, the lower the risk, the lower the premium. So we can use all these leverage to improve people's awareness on fire safety. This is a very good example, a village in Japan. All the fire hydrants, fire pumps, they have done a lot of rehearsals as a big event in the village to promote fire safety knowledge and to improve the awareness of people. And the final page, Aside from protection of historic buildings, fire safety is the top priority as a risk counselor. It's also our priority, but there are also other risky factors worthy of our attention. For example, in Shanghai, there are typhoons, storms, flood, etc. Yes, the water drainage system is not so updated, so there are problems of flooding. And also, if they bring in a lot of commercial operations, then these commercial entities will do their own decoration, their own, they do their own renovation. As you can see that all of the things kind of pose a lot of threats.
Well, also as a historical place, some of the places will be turned into tourist attractions. So we have to consider the internal structure, for example, whether the streets are wide enough and how to better guide people. And also you have to consider overall safety management. Thank you very much for your attention. That's my sharing. Thank you very much, Mr. Go. You talk about risk perspective. You talk about risk management. So now it's time for Q&A. First of all, I would like to throw out the first question. Well, before, well, the first question is to Mr. Wang Xing from Arup, China, because you said that uh, Dr. Shen mentioned the need of cooperation, the multi-party cooperation. As an architecture, how do you cooperate with other stakeholders? That's my question. Well, for that question, actually I prepared a slide. I want to share the slides with you so that I can drive my point better. It's a few words about it how we how i collaborated with dr sun this is the flagship store of huawei in shanghai and going to talk about this collaboration from the perspective of architecture and i'm only going to touch upon three things firstly we have to address the fire protection issue because the building was first built in 1973 and it used to be a building that the insiders didn't have a roof, but we added the roof later on. So we have to consider fire protection. We have to follow existing rules. On the one hand, we have to consider fire protection. And on the other hand, we have to design it properly so that it looks pretty as well. So as you can see that at the very top, there are some dark spots. The dark spots are places where we use dark colors to hide the smoke exhaust devices. In other words, the point I want to make is that fire protection is indeed a great concern, but on the other hand, it has to be considered in combination with the overall design beauty. And secondly, I want to talk about evacuation. So here I'm showing you a few pictures illustrating how we managed to do the evacuation for that building. Actually, that is similar to people's routes. In other words, when I consider people's routes, I have to also think about evacuation. Also, there is a alley for customers. So actually, we designed it. And thirdly, I want to talk about the truth the materials. There are a lot of materials that we can't use when considering fire protection because these materials are easily inflammable. So we have to avoid them. But in doing that building, we chose copper. Why? Because copper is widely used in the communications industry. So when we reported the idea of using copper to the owner Huawei, they said that this idea is really Good because they're so familiar with copper, they use it day in, day out. So the point is, in choosing materials, not only do we have to consider fire protection, we also have to consider materials that are most relevant to the building that we do. So these are the three points I want to talk about. You have to consider fire protection as well as beauty, aesthetics, and uh, the building themselves. He gave us a very good 
example. And Arup, as you are all familiar, that is a famous design institute. So it is no surprise that Arup, Arup's idea was received with great um, recommendation from Huawei. The next question is to Mr. Zhu. Can you talk about your collaboration with Arup or any other partners? Anything that you can share with us? I can't, it seems I can't answer that. It's really hard. Because when we work, we actually, we didn't work a lot with design institutes from the UK, but indeed we did a lot of projects for Huawei in Shanghai as well. So you asked me to talk about our collaboration with UK parties. There's no way for me to share anything because most of our projects are in China. But I can talk about our cases specifically. I can talk about fire protection because we encountered issues related to fire protection a lot in a lot of our projects. So I echoed with previous speakers very well. Because when talking about the preservation of ancient buildings, fire protection is always a topic. We if you consider fire protection, sometimes the facilities will make the historic buildings less beautiful. But on the other hand, if you are from a fire protection perspective, you can argue that without consideration of fire resistance, Sometimes the buildings will no longer exist if they're burnt. Then there's no way or there's no need for you to talk about ancient buildings at all. So there is a lot to say when it comes to the combination of fire protection and preservation of historic buildings. So I want to talk about the biggest challenge in China. I think the biggest challenge is still about system or mechanism. Dr. Sun talk about the systematic or holistic design of a building from top down, from building materials, devices, from design all the way to construction, and further down to maintenance and use. That was very detailed. So if we were able to hire a group for each of our project, to do overall consulting, then we won't encounter any issues at all. But that is not a feasible approach because sometimes when the projects are small, there, there's no way for you or you can't, uh, you wouldn't consider hiring a route. And sometimes you, you do, uh, it's like in the gray area. The Starbucks case is very good case in point. If it were a small shop, then that design might not be approved. But it wasn't the case for Starbucks because Jing'an district needed such a flagship store. So they would approve it, but they wouldn't approve it for any other project. So fire protection and fire issue must be addressed if you want to do proper urban renewal. But there are issues with government mechanism, a lot of approvals needed. If you want to change the function of the building, approval is needed. If you want to do decoration, you might change the structure of the building. You need to get approval again. And for a new building, approvals are also needed. And the new building specifications or new building rules are not enough to address issues for a new building then. How can I expect it can be applied or it can address 
issues related to ancient buildings because we have so many ancient buildings from different dynasties. There is no way for it to address everything. So as long as the approval system is there, then there are always issues. Even if with approval, even if a plan is approved, how can the government departments make sure that the follow-up operations and maintenance will also work well? But it's always case by case. For example, the Huawei building now looks very good, but we have to address the overall systematic or mechanism issue. Mr. Zhou touched upon a core issue about government mechanism. Mr. Wang from Arup touched upon three things about collaboration, but Mr. Zhou just talked about risk. I have another question, but this question is to Wang Guo. How do we better guard off risks? How do we make sure that ancient buildings look dynamic and also they are fire resistant? Thank you very much. Well, in our process, in the process of our own work, we always see the actual operations of different types of buildings, be it industrial or commercial buildings. So I don't think that the existing rules and regulations meet the requirements of existing buildings. So there are problems. And one problem is that when government departments do review, they review details. So there are, is indeed an issue. But how do we address it? How do we achieve proper balance? So we have to think holistic. Sometimes you think that you might have the uh, idea that fire protection relies upon facilities and equipment. But my years of work experience tell me that facilities and equipment are only there when there are incidents but people's awareness and education is also very important. In particular, awareness of owners, they have to be very concerned about fire protection. Let me give an example. If you do a new project, you hire the best design institute, the best consulting, best construction contractor, and everything is completed 100%. Everything is perfect. But there are also issues related to maintenance and proper use. Because fire protection, there is no in between, it's only one and zero, meaning that there, there, is, there are only two status. You can use it or you cannot use it. For example, if you fail to make, maintain facilities well, even if everything at the very beginning, is 100% perfect. As time goes by, they will, there will be problems. And these problems are not uncommon through our year's experience. So I think in addition to paying attention to the facilities and equipment, you have to also lay equal emphasis on people's awareness and how to raise people's awareness I do think there is a need for risk transfer tool, meaning that owners have to balance the costs and benefits in order for them to be voluntarily uh, aware. For example, we have a client, not in Shanghai, but in Chengdu. You will find that there are a lot of issues with them in maintaining the facilities. So the second year, the premium goes up significantly. Then the mindset of the customer changed. 
so a lot of times the customer's priority is to save money to make money we are a counseling insurance company in the insurance industry so if if the internet is not that prevalent nowadays then most likely you don't get to hear a lot of fire accidents even though we may provide our customers with a lot of fire related suggestions advice precautions but still in their mindset this is not on top of their priority because they base their decision on their previous experience so my customer like i have mentioned even though they did not realize realize the risks themselves but the economic impl implications triggered them to pay greater attention to fire safety i've traveled to a lot of different places the realization on the importance of fire safety is not that good yet we need to improve to raise the awareness of our people the adjustment in the premium level can actually trigger people to pay greater attention to fire safety and its potential risks. Starting from the 4th of January this year in Shanghai, is now accelerating the program of digitization, citywide digitization. And they're going to roll out some action plans for promoting digitization in the development of the city. So Mr. Guo from on Kofco, in the process of transformation toward digitization, the construction companies, in terms of application of digitization, for contractors, can technology help them to solve some of the issues? For example, Internet of Things to be applied in fire control. So we are wondering. In the process of digitization, our contractors, can they use digital technology to solve their pain points? Mr. Zhu, Mr. Zhen. So for contractors, currently, we have already made some attempts in terms of dig digital tools, some applications, a digital model for example, renovation of the old district and also the new projects, construction of new projects. Before the project began, we would set up a model to guarantee precise construction, especially in the renovation of old district. We don't tolerate the digging of the streets and then covering them up and then redigging this is not tolerable this is not tolerated so we want to use the digital tools in order to improve efficiency second is process management we have set up a project management platform according to the construction plan to set up models 
to be combined with the on-site construction to compare the theory, the model, with the actual situation on site. In order to allow for precise management. Thirdly, inside the company, safety management and quality control, quality monitoring. We also use a lot of digital tools. Just now, I saw a project related to elevator repair and upgrade. Old buildings to to be equipped with um, with elevators so the staircase and the door of the ele ele elevator can be set in the same space so just now mr Zhen also answered the second question as you can see in the chat box So for those of you online, if you have any question, please feel free to raise your question. Then I would like to turn the floor to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wang. Our panel are real experts. So thank you all very much for attending today's seminar. Today's event is sponsored by EUSME Center. They have some questions that we would like to invite you to answer, please feel free to scan the QR code to complete the survey. And then the final part of today's session. This is already the third session of the serial forum. The previous two series, the previous two sessions happened almost two years ago because of the pandemic. We're very much looking forward to hearing perspectives, perspectives from different organizations. If you are very interested in this topic, anything that you are looking forward to, please feel free to contact us. On this platform, as you can see from the screen, are the QR code of the three organizers of today's sessions. Please feel free to contact them and to follow up on their activities. So that wraps up today's session. Thank you very much for your participation. On site, if you have time, please feel free to go to the pre British bar to have a taste of the whiskey from UK. Uh, 